It's yours, all right? Cool. The internet has given us a rare moment to change all of history forward. However, if centralized actors wind up taking that opportunity, it could reset things by another 3,000 years. I'm Mark Nadal. I do not build blockchain systems. I have no token to sell you. Instead, I work with some of the largest nonprofits in the world, like Internet Archive, and help push forward humanitarian initiatives. And we do that through decentralization, through peer-to-peer -peer systems, not blockchain. And we've been able to scale up to about 60 million monthly active users. But here, today, I am here to plead with you as you are on the frontier and bleeding edge of technology, of blockchains. To think of blockchains as a stepping stone towards a greater vision for humanity. For the first time in 5,000 years of debt, we can move beyond. And so I'm looking for the optimists that want to make an impact beyond the narrative that humanity has had for so long. So blockchain is definitely more than just being a linked list. We don't particularly care about those aspects. What it is, is that it's a revolutionary system to have a public social ledger that blockchains let us have block parties. <laughs> but it's the exciting thing about removing the middleman from the equation that's so important. Now, the issue is, all of these logos are the same category as what we work with in zero-sum games. Blockchain is still a zero-sum game. If I give you one dollar, I lose it, you gain it. It doesn't matter who it's through, even if it's through a middleman. If I give you one Bitcoin, I still lose one Bitcoin and you gain it. It's still a zero-sum game. It is categorically the same thing. So I apologize for this. <laughs> I don't know how it's going to go over. If we kiss goodbye to Goldman ball sacks, uh, sorry, I Goldman Sachs. I guess I should have said Fartgo Wall Street. Uh, maybe I'm chasing the pun too hard. <laughs> if they go poof, it doesn't change the social ledger that we care about. These guys run the block party when it comes to public social ledgers. And since we're at a hackathon, I want to just quickly pause and step over and do a demo. So we're going to take gun and test to see how fast it can run with a test runner that we built called Panic. And it's going to synchronize 100,000 chat messages that just generated and synchronize 100,000 chat messages between two browser tabs and I can come here and click this button, the UI stays responsive as we're syncing 100,000 chat messages. We just synced 10,000 chat messages per second. So it's perfectly possible, that took eight years, <laughs> took eight years to build systems that can run that fast in JavaScript in the browser. It's perfectly possible to be able to build decentralized peer-to-peer -peer systems. Oh, I had another fun pun. Right. I just wanted to note, actually, that um, when it comes to money, we are used to having to pay fees, whether you're in a third world or not. But when it comes to applications, when it comes to what Google and these other systems provide, is that 80% of the world's population runs on less than $10 a day. So it doesn't matter how low we can get the gas fees, when we're dealing with something that is effectively negligible in its costs, that scarcity mindset can create a really big barrier for how people might use and interact with the system. And it's part of the reason why I've had such success in scaling up, because when you remove the barrier and friction of, of wallets and costs, then anybody can join, because it's free. Um, but a bigger piece is people just wondered, well, can decentralized systems scale up? And, and the answer is yes. I've, I've spent eight years doing that. It's not what I'm here to talk about, but I just want to encourage people that like these, these, these things can scale. They can work. Even if we get Google and Facebook and big tech to go away, there's still these middlemen. 
nation state actors are another type of middleman. And there's a lot of talk about the excitement over governance, that governance this, governance that, but because I come from a humanitarian background and I focus on the nonprofits and uh, anti-monopoly startups, what I, what I care about is actually not having more governance, but less. Freedom should not be a product that I have to purchase. It should be a right. So the amount of governance in a system is inversely proportional to how healthy that economic system is. This is contrary to a lot of the thinking these days. If you had a perfect economic system, the less governance you have is an indicator of it being a better, healthier economic system. So as we think about these things, it's vital to understand the role of how debt-based or money-based systems restrict us to being a single planetary game. And, he and here's why. There's three different markets. There's the consumer market, the lobby market, and the nation-state markets where countries compete with other countries to acquire citizens. And the overlap between those different markets is different. Big tech, when it comes to social applications, winds up being in the consumer market. But when you have stuff like Bitcoin and Ethereum, they're fundamentally competing with fiat currencies, which is the nation state market. They're different overlaps, they're different sections. And that then poses the three ends problem for pretty much any cryptocurrency. But in this case, I'm gonna specifically explore Bitcoin, which is, of course, it could just go to zero, right? Every government in the world could ban it, which is you know, unlikely, even if they tried, it'd be unlikely to happen. Um, but theoretically, hypothetically, in these categories of the three different ways Bitcoin could end, it could end by just becoming nothing. That's not particularly interesting. What's interesting is if it goes to the moon, it could become nuclear. Because any proof of work based consensus mechanism is intentionally, or was, <laughs> intentionally bound by thermodynamic laws of physics. So if we did the opposite, rather than every government banning Bitcoin, if every government adopted Bitcoin, you would have a nuclear arms race to create nuclear powered mining rigs. But that's a fundamental problem because governments, nation states have monopoly force on nukes. And nuclear energy has disproportionately, adversarially high energy yields that soon any blockchain with that mechanism would wind up becoming not decentralized. And maybe that's one of the little secret reasons as to why the merge happened. And maybe it's a little stab that, hey, nation state actors can't step in with nuclear <laughs> uh, mining rigs for proof of work. The third option, which is the most realistic one, oops, is that the systems get forever stuck in a lockstep with each other. This is adversarial cooperation because they're ultimate enemies with each other, but they battle and battle and battle forever. And this winds up having only one possible direction things can go through each adversarial reactionary response. And I'm gonna predict how that will play out in these three steps. So the first one, of course, is just um, any criminal can use cryptocurrencies to avoid paying taxes and dodging all that stuff. It's already happening, right? We don't like it. It brings a bad name to the industry. But as blockchain gets adopted more and more over time, it's not like nation states aren't going to clamp down on that. And that's going to make it increasingly more difficult for regular good tax-paying citizens to deal with stuff, because they're gonna have more tax forms to fill out, that are gonna have fear of unrealized capital gains, and all of that stress. But good tax-paying citizens will evolve a type of response where we put emojis on the blockchain, where if we don't have any particular price value for a transaction between us, one Bitcoin, one Ethereum, minus one, plus one, and everything's balanced out on the blockchain. If I say, hey, you know, I, I gave a haircut to Fred, and then a few days later he spots me a dinner, there's no price set with that. So people are like, ha, 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 ha. It's not like the government can make giving gifts or services illegal, right? It's just human nature. They can't stop that. And how are they going to tax it if it doesn't have a number on it? 
The issue is this was already tried back in the 80s with like, gift cards and loyalty programs and all that stuff. And it creates a worse, it breeds a worse adversarial response by the government because as enough people do that over the time, governments want to have their cut. So what they do is they wind up fixing prices in each industry. They wind up having some bureaucracy that comes in and says, no, you cannot sell beer higher than this. You cannot sell beer lower than this. This is the price of each product category across all industries. It just invites a breeding ground for the government to overreach in response. So then what are we supposed to do then? The issue is that our public social ledger has become an accounting system that the government will always be able to use to enslave us. Anything that is on the blockchain, the government will eventually hunt down, figure out, track down, and so our response is if nothing, if no debts are recorded, we cannot be indebted. Our response is to do nothing. The future of money is none. Remember this slide? Zero-sum games. You cannot win a game the government made. If you're playing the same game a government made, you cannot win. You cannot win the same game government made. So I invite you to think about new games. Games that go beyond this 5,000 year narrative of debt. Win-win additive only currencies. And it's really not that scary. It's kindergarten math. It's one plus one equals two. We didn't balance it out to zero. We're just removing debt from the equation. But aha, if you are an economist, it'd be like, but Mark, that will create inflationary systems. And then it will expand so much, it won't have any basis for its value, and it will collapse. But no, we got more math. <laughs> It's been hiding in front of us the whole time. Supply over demand gives us a way to model scarcity and post-scarcity. If we have two Lamborghinis and four toddlers, then the abundance factor of Lambos is 50%. However, if we have more lunches than people can eat, if there's 100 lunches and 10 people, it's a 10x abundance factor. If it happens to be movies, that are information that be infinitely copied at negligible costs, well, then we might have 20 billion copies of some pirated content. And this is why DMCA has to come in, because it has to use government regulation in order to enforce bad economics. Because the economics cannot handle post-scarcity. The internet has given us an opportunity to change things moving forward. And so there certainly are some things that are post-scarce, but not all things are. And now we have a simple equation to model those things. So how do we deal with that post-scarcity? I wanna scare <laughs> you into post-scarcity. <laughs> Sorry, my, my, my puns have been really bad tonight. Uh, I'm here all night, <laughs> literally, it's a hackathon. Um, with the handshake problem. The handshake problem is going to scare you for any zero-sum debt-based game, whether it be fiat or your blockchain. And in order to talk about it, I have to explain, right? The handshake problem is a traveling salesman goes to a conference and everybody wants to network with each other. So how many handshakes are gonna happen across the whole conference? How many unique business cards are gonna be exchanged between each people? And it's modeled by this ridiculously simple equation of n by n minus one over two. Um, the kind of easiest way I can show you how deceptively different this equation is and than what its reality is, is to actually use the handshake across Facebook. Pretend I'm Mark Zucker or Nadal, and I am gonna give you an exclusive deal to get for less than one penny all data on each pairwise handshake. So handshake is like the relationship between me and my mom. That would be, you would get all of the text messages on that. But it also might mean the relationship between me and a random kid in China or Africa, which I have no connection to. So there's gonna be no information on that. But to make the deal sweeter, 
I'm gonna say you have lifetime royalty-free access to all data that shows up on any handshake that you buy. So maybe that data doesn't exist now, but if it exists in the future, then you would be able to get access to that. So if you're an advertiser and you have an unlimited budget, and I'm offering a sweet, sweet deal of 1% of one penny, but you have to buy every single handshake across all of Facebook's 2.4 billion users, how much do you think it's gonna cost? A mm, couple hundred million dollars? A few billion? It's, it's less than 1% of a penny per handshake. 200 trillion dollars, more than double the world GDP, more than five times the US national debt. It is so absurdly large when you perform the handshake problem that you get numbers a calculator can't even crunch. You have to go to big end. <laughs> uh, something's gotta be wrong here, right? Something's gotta be strange or off, but no, this is what Google and Facebook and information systems to do. The network effect of information systems has a tremendous amount of more value in it than the capital assets in the network. I'm gonna say that again. The network effect of information systems has a tremendous amount more information than the capital that exists, than the capital assets that exist in that network. Because you can infinitely resell information without losing it. It is a non-zero-sum game. And so this creates a terrifying vacuum suck of money in an economy for any debt-based system. Google and Facebook are first coming for fiat systems. <laughs> money is finite. Well, unless the government starts printing it, but then you get the inflationary problem. And if you're able to resell information an infinite amount of times, you will be able to suck all of the money out of a system. So first they're coming for fiat, and then they're coming for you, because this is a mathematical category where post-scarcity engulfs scarcity, if you can model the two, just like Newton to Einstein, Einsteinian systems are able to eat Newton for breakfast, and so can post-scarce systems to scarcity systems. So we have to be extremely careful. It's not just me that's thinking about it. I hope I'm making you think really hard and long about this problem because there's other very large, powerful systems out there that are considering changing in this direction. Just ask anybody who runs the fraud department at a credit card company or any payment processor. The information, the network effects in an information system contain a tremendous amount more value than the capital assets in that network. Do we just give up hope that centralized nation state actor is gonna hijack it all and no. This is, as soon as we're able to model the mathematics of post-scarcity, it means that there's a new branch of economics that I'm calling freeism. There's a lot to explore here. And it's extremely important we do it in decentralized ways in order to stop a dystopian future from occurring. So the issue is how do you make sure that um, Goods are actually produced. So supply over demand equals the abundance factor. What if you, you know, uh, don't have enough Lamborghinis for everybody to drive? Um, so you wind up having the following equation, which is for every good less than an abundance factor of one, provide a reward function prioritized or proportional to the demand that increases the supply. Yay! <laughs> now we got four Lamborghinis for our four toddlers. I don't know why toddlers are driving Lamborghinis. Um, and so the supply over demand is one. We've hit an abundance factor. But the issue is, well, Mark, like, what's actually going to drive people to do that? Well, hey, guess what? We actually have a way to model reward as access to scarce luxury. This has worked really well for capitalism. People like luxurious stuff. But in this system, we actually have a way to model what is the highest demand, luxury. And so the reward function, if you wind up creating more supply for an in-demand item, then you'll get early access to luxury goods. The math here can be really simple. It doesn't have to be scary. Sorry, I did use a bunch of equations there, but. The future is possible, and we're at an extremely important point in human history where the internet has given us a rare moment
to change all of history forward for the observable and non-observable universe. Humanity only has two places to expand to, out to other planets and into the metaverse of our own creation. But that's why it should also start to get really scary if as our brains become networked into this system, if there is a monopoly middleman that is the barrier between our thoughts, that controls and monopolizes that coordination between our thoughts. And it should get even scarier than that because what we're able to effortlessly create in the metaverse without bounds by the laws of physics, we will be able to push a button and 3D print it in reality. What we can effortlessly create in the metaverse, we'll be able to 3D print into reality. So we need to be very careful who has control of those network effects in these information systems as we expand out to other planets. So in closing, we're here at Hackathon. I want to encourage you to think of blockchain as an important step in the last 5,000 years of human history that we're able to decentralize money supply. But don't let that story end there. Humanity can move past that into post-scarcity and creating abundance, just like the internet has done for us, and allowing us to coordinate coming here to a hackathon to build and to create, for us to come together in a physical place because we had coordination through an infinite space of the internet. And in closing, I want to read a little poem for you, the builders, the creators, the people who create stuff, whether digital or not, is that don't be chasing to be king, don't be climbing to be pharaoh, to be clamoring to be president, be the master of your own hands, the owner of your own craft, for here lies dominion more profound than all the rulers combined. Because a king still has to sleep in a bed, a president has to tweet from his phone on the throne. A pope has to be driven, a pope has to be flown, and a pharaoh is nothing more than his papyrus scroll after his toilet paper skull is unrolled. He's remembered by the chiseled hieroglyphs in his room, not by the lingering soul in his tomb. Thank you.